Is there a special exemption for renewable energy? An exemption that exempts it from health and safety law, in particular Legionella. I'm Barry Johnson from Solar Twin, and I'm looking at a number of themes in this area. Starting, we're looking at themes to reduce water temperatures. If you store water at 50 degrees instead of 60, you'll save a quarter of your energy. That's a fact, whether that energy is solar or not. Similarly, if you change from heating your hot water to uh, 24 hours a day to just for a few hours a day in the evening, you'll cut the energy losses by between a quarter and a half. That's quite substantial. Interestingly, those savings are about the same as installing a hot water system that is run by solar. Here's a, a simulation that shows the difference of changing from 24-hour backup heating without solar to just evening only, and you save 37% of the energy. Quite substantial. And then this green benefit happens whether the energy is saved is solar or green or not. Here's a summary of the difference between heat pumps and solar heating. Solar heating performs seasonally. The grey bar shows what happens, and that grey bar is in response to the amount of sun you get. There's six times more sun in June than December. Solar heating and heat pumps are used in a range of single-family and multi-user installations, including health centres, and the risks obviously depend not just on the plumbing, but on the people exposed as well. And um, the highest risk is going to be health applications. Looking at the plumbing of solar and heat pumps, there are several potential risk areas. I'm only going to look at one of them, and that's hot water storage today. The focus, therefore, is hot water storage on solar heating and, le and, and heat pumps. And if you look at the European and British guidance on Legionella, it says you've got to store hot water and heat it to the base to 60 for an hour each day. The interesting thing is that domestic hot water systems in solar don't usually comply with that because the backup heating is halfway up instead. And there's a special solar coil at the bottom which doesn't usually heat, which doesn't always heat to 60 degrees of every day. And the diagram on the right is the typical one. The boxed area in that diagram is called the dedicated solar volume in space. And it could be asked whether it's a dedicated Legionella volume because it has a large volume, a large area, and a large time of exposure to risk. How long can that time be? Well, it can be nearly three months. Here's the Danish records of the temperature at the bottom of a hot water cylinder, a solar cylinder. And um, Denmark has a similar sort of latitude as Scotland. So we're looking at data which is worrying. The risk for solar is you have larger volumes to inhabit than you would in a normal cylinder. You've got a larger surface area and you've got more time to grow because the cylinders are usually bigger. There are other issues as well. Paragraph 158 in the HSC Legionella guidance says there's a pack of four. You have to heat to 60 for an hour every day to the base. Does that happen with a conventional hot water cylinder? It heats to 60 at the top for an hour every day, but not to the base. That's the problem. What's interesting is that there's a historical green exemption for from heating to the base, and the Centre for European Standards, their Solar Technical Committee 312, has had a paper out on this asking for special consideration because in, they claim that 50% of the energy wouldn't be, wouldn't, be, wouldn't be collected if you did heat to the base. We disagree with that. It says there's no need to heat to the base. We disagree with that. First of all, the energy considerations are wrong. You'd lose about 10% of the energy, not 50. And secondly, if you do have special consideration for solar, why not give it for anything else that saves energy? Because energy is energy anyway. The argument that the hot top of a cylinder is not robust because high water flow rates and the like aren't going to stack up. They're going to go through there. And so the concern is that across Europe, lots and lots of exempt installations are going in. Since 1999, the number of installations has risen. And these installations that are mapped here will stay in for decades. So they're an accumulation of non-compliant installations, as there are in Britain. About 80% of British installations don't comply with the Legionella guidance. And the non-compliance of solar heating with the HSE guidance is ubiquitous across UK documents. Building regs part G contain it on water. Building regs part L on energy refer to it as well. And the domestic heating compliance guide and their subsidiary documents, building services compliance guide, the SAP energy calculations guide, also non-compliance. And even outside the building regs, the microgeneration certification scheme 
and its installation of non-compliant systems. The Energy Saving Trust um, so prefers non-compliant schemes. So does the Chartered Institute of Building Services Engineers, whose document on solar is being reviewed as I write. The British Plumbing Education Council Solar Installments Manual also has non-compliant installations. And there have even been best practice guides being drafted which claim that the bigger the dedicated solar volume, in other words, the bigger, bigger the dedicated Legionella volume, the better a system is. A very strange approach to best practice. What's interesting is that most renewable heat consumers aren't aware of any exemption. The European Standards Committee refused to get into dialogue with me. The building research establishment have administered grants for tens of thousands of people State money has been spent on installing tens of thousands of non-compliant solar heating installations in terms of Legionella. And the Solar Trade Association have been trying to shut me up for years. It's scary. So, are consumers being kept well informed to the extent of the Legionella debate? No. The grant bodies hush up on it. So does the Solar Trade Association, and so does the Consumers Association, who were going to publish an article on it in spring 2009, but pulled it following industry pressure. So, how far could this trade-off go? Well, let's just look at risk first. A small Danish study found that 50% of solar homes had Legionella, compared with 8% of non-solar homes, but it was a small study. And other studies have found no risk. So the field data is scant. But outside Europe, there is some evidence that, um, for example, in Antigua, there was solar, solar and Legionella linked. Can you do a risk index? Well, one is to look at the area on which the biofilm for Legionella can be, multiply that by the volume of water in which they can grow, and increase, multiply that by the time before the heating intervenes to, or the, or the um, total exchange of water takes place in the hot water cylinder, and you get a risk index. And here's one for, at the top, a, no, a non-solar cylinder, and at the bottom for a conventional solar one. And if you multiply all those indices up, you end up with a risk index of 32 for a conventional hot water cylinder in a house without solar, and it being 320 if you add solar. That's a tenfold increase in Legionella risk. Now, there are lots of different ways of doing risk assessments. This is just one. But a tenfold increase on the basis of one assessment is pretty worrying. I asked an insurer, would they cover it? And Court Price said it would void cover if you put in a system which was in breach of regulations without justification. So how is this trade-off between risk and energy um, described. Well, 10 times higher risk is what we are looking at. The Liverpool University Hospitals expert, Tom Macon, said it's highly likely. Um, some consultants said it was a serious flaw in design, but the Solar Trade Association say concern is unjustified. So what areas fall outside L8 guidance? The majority of plumbing diagrams that actually are illustrated in the DEFRA um, energy guidance booklet are outside guidance. There are safer installations. Here are two, a direct cylinder and a thermal store, and you can heat to the base in a direct cylinder, or you can have a retrofit heat exchanger. A thermal store has about only 5% of the risk, according to our calculations that I'll show you earlier. A direct conventional system has about 10% less energy delivered for the same size panel, but costs about 20% less than a twin coil cylinder, so the cost benefits are better. A thermal store costs more than a twin coil cylinder because it has a large heat exchanger, but generally delivers more energy. So there are safer alternatives to conventional twin coil cylinders, including heating to the base in the evenings, um, or twin coil cylinders with de-strap pumps that are on at the same time as the backup heating, or thermal stores. Both perform fine in energy and cost benefit terms, so why aren't they being installed in large numbers now? If you want to expand and look at other areas, here they are, stop the video. So who has the final say? All I say is, please, let's take the decision on where to move in terms of risk assessment and Legionella and solar and heat pumps. Take it out of the political arena. Let's not wait until a Legionella case happens. That's too late. Because there's a chance of an iceberg. There are 100,000 solar thermal homes today, but that's going to grow by 7 million, to 7 million by 2020, according to government aims. That's a 70-fold increase. Let's not build in deficient installations now. There's the summary. Thanks for your interest. Bye now.